Hello and welcome to the India Hangout. The Delhi University is going back to a four-year undergraduate program from a three-year undergraduate program, or rather from a four-year four to a three-year undergraduate program. And it, earlier it went from a three-year to a four-year one. Now, obviously, the four-year one was unusual and had attracted a lot of controversy. But the problem was, or rather the larger issue is, that the university had the autonomy to do it earlier, but it does not seem to have the autonomy to retain it. And therefore, is being forced to go back to a three-year which raises a slightly larger question that we are trying to address today. What to extent is the uh, or the degree of the autonomy that uh, Indian universities have or the Indian education system has? And therefore, is the command and control structure of education in this country causing serious problems with uh, education, particularly higher education in this case? I am my co-anchor here, uh, Ayaz Memon at Cricketwala, also joining us uh, uh, two uh, gentlemen. Uh, uh, Neeraj Hathikar, uh, Dr. Neeraj Hathikar, professor at Bombay University, who was in the news earlier for out, uh, speaking out on some of the problems being faced by Bombay University. We try and understand whether there's a link between some of the issues that he raised and with the larger issue of autonomy. Uh, Parth Shah from the Center for Civil Society in Delhi, Parth Shah has been uh, studying the larger issues in education and also advocating uh, causes within education from his uh, organization. Uh, I asked. Yeah, so uh, Govind, I think uh, you actually said it all, but just to kind of address the issues. One is that how, how does anything, any decision affect students? Fundamentally, yeah. this whole thing is about whether the students benefit or not. Yeah. The other is, of course, whether the university is done right or not. Yeah. And the, the third, most crucial, is should the government at all be exercising any control? Hmm. And if so, how much? Yeah. I think these are the fundamental Yeah, and it issues. seems pretty traumatic because you're talking about uh, thousands of students going from a three-year course to a four-year course and therefore all the effort uh, gone into design that four-year course yeah. and now being pushed back to a three-year course, whether they like it or not. Absolutely. It's going around in, you know, in circles. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll come to you, Dr. Hathikar, in a moment, but uh, uh, Parth, can you give us a sense on how you are uh, looking at this issue? Walk us through what you think are the key problems and uh, challenges raised in the way this man uh, issue has been handled? I think there are two key issues, right? One is the process through which the decision has been made, either to allow four-year course or now uh, to disallow it. I think the process itself is a big concern. And secondly, I think maybe a subsidiary question is about the pros and cons of the four-year degree uh, that DU uh, has uh, sort of uh, put into place. I think first part is far more important from systemic point of view. Uh, and that's where I think the autonomy of university and colleges are completely being undermined. And as I understand it, the UGC does not, on paper, have a control over such policies. On paper, universities are free to decide the course structures and curriculum and all of that uh, through internal mechanisms of governance they have. But I think what is happening in the UGC, obviously, is the grant-making organization. And uh, so fear that if you don't tow the UGC line, uh, your funding would then uh, be jeopardized. And that is the fear that I think forcing colleges and universities to then go out of their way and actually undermine their own autonomy, which is given by law, and accept UGC's dictum. I think that raises a larger issue in terms of the financing of higher education and uh, the way it is being done uh, here in India. Right? Uh, I think one... There are different ways of thinking about how to change the financing, but I think one simple way to think about it uh, is to make sure that those who can afford to pay should be paying much higher fees uh, than what they currently pay. So instead of subsidizing everyone who goes to uh, St. Stephen's or Xavier's College, uh, those who can afford to pay, they should be able to charge a full fee and cover the cost from them. Right. Those who cannot can be given a scholarship or uh, subsidized loans to cover their cost. So I think the model that we have followed so far overall in higher education, that there's a across the board subsidy for everyone who goes to college, right? Which results in a very bizarre situation. A student who until class 12, say in an international school, was paying four to five lakhs a year, suddenly pays 5,000 a year the moment he joins the college. It's hard to argue the parents lost capacity to pay when the student left class 12 and joined the first year in college. Right. So I think well, that universal subsidy itself is right. a big challenge. And that needs to be thought through in terms of larger issues of financing our education. 
Part, uh, we'll, uh, we'll come to the financing in a moment, but if we were to take a step back, right, what, are the, what is the more fundamental question we're asking here? I mean, because we're finally trying to uh, 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 find out and then perhaps uh, ensure in some ways that a government does not play a predominant role in deciding uh, a school or college level uh, curriculum and structures and so on, isn't it? Yes, exactly. I think not just school and college, I mean, you know, school also, right? So we do have the same kind of mindset even in school education uh, where the textbooks are written by the government and every change in government then brings about the same old debate about either congressization of textbooks or separatization of textbooks. And it happens every change in government. So I think we need to look at the autonomy and give genuine autonomy to institutions of uh, learning, whether they are schools or colleges. And that is a larger issue in terms of the mindset change. So these are not political institutions to be sort of football around. And that, of course, raises a lot of large number of issues in terms of why is the president uh, a chancellor of the universities by default. Right? So I think you can start with a lot of small, small issues. But I think all of them together create this larger mindset that government, in a sense, is in charge of running and deciding what should happen. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Hatikar, uh, do tell us how, how you see this issue. I mean, you're someone who uh, obviously were in the news for raising issues to do with the quality of education and the quality of Bombay University standing. Uh, I mean, you had pointed out, uh, if you were quoted accurately, that uh, the, uh, the rank of Bombay University had come down from uh, 96 to 150 in that time span that you were referring to. So these are fundamental issues to do with quality. How much of this is linked to the way the university in, in your or, in, or your university functions and the autonomy that it gets? In principle, universities are autonomous. Uh, in principle, they are governed by, in Maharashtra, they are governed by, governed by a Maharashtra Universities Act and there are various autonomous bodies of the university which are supposed to run the university. Uh, okay, so so in principle they are indeed autonomous. The state government has certain powers because the state government ultimately provides the salaries. So it it rightly has certain powers. But what happens in principle is is universities are hardly ever autonomous because everyone right from the vice chancellor to the pro vice chancellor to the BCD director and members of various bodies are either appointed directly by politicians or have some very strong political connections. Uh, and therefore, there is really nothing much uh, that a university body can do independently of how the, the education minister uh, wants it to be done uh, or uh, people in important political powers in, uh, to uh, you know, see it. And therefore, the bodies like the Senate, for example, of the university or the academic councils of the university, which are supposed to decide things, or the board of studies, which are supposed to decide right. curricula, course of studies, etc., hardly ever get that freedom because, uh, you know, those, those things, for example, in the, the syllabus of the Mumbai University, Rowington Mystery's book, uh, which was a part of the syllabus of the English, uh, of, the, of the master's program in English, uh, was removed overnight because one politician felt that it was derogatory to their party and he met the vice chancellor and the vice chancellor obliged him. Uh, so, you know, so those kinds of powers are really undermining in spite of the constitutional provisions that we have. Right. Okay. Uh, but, how, you know, so the, the, what as uh, Professor Hathikar uh, points out, this is a fundamental issue and I think uh, he is referring to the political interference and obviously a political interference which seems to uh, manifest itself in rapid changes in uh, curriculum or maybe uh, appointments and so on. So, first of all, is this something that can be addressed in some ways because if, if on paper they are autonomous then how do you keep people at bay? Uh, secondly, is there a, another sort of more fundamental problem why uh, politicians uh, or people in politics tend to interfere and can they be kept at bay? I think as, uh, as was pointed out earlier, largely the reason is the fact that they are financing it. And I think it is always sort of going to be the case that those who finance would have some control over what you can do. So I think there are two. I think one, of course, is the appointment should be completely internal. So why do we need to have somebody from outside being appointed uh, as a vice chancellor or a pro-vice chancellor, right? So why isn't it possible to create a structure within universities and colleges where they themselves select who are the leaders of the college? Uh, I think that requires very different mindset change, and that's uh, something that we need to strive for. So that's that the one part come the about is, is my question. Hmm? How will that mindset change come about? Is that is my question? I think uh, one one is that for some of the uh, state governments, 
to be able to, I think, be more progressive in this issue and show examples where this can be delivered. Right? Uh, I think it cannot be done uh, in a one go across the whole country. It would have to start in some places. Uh, IIT and IIM, for example, try to achieve something similar for themselves. Uh, right? And one of the reasons why they increase their fees is to become uh, more independent uh, of the government finances. So I think even I am, I, IITs had faced a huge trouble in achieving this goal. Uh, and I think that's an effort that needs to be made on right. a constant basis. And I, as Professor pointed out, people, faculty members in uh, our better universities are the, I think, key force to drive this change. So, so can I just, I mean, I'll look at, let's look at the flip side. Let's play the devil's advocate here. Suppose there is no consistency. So every university can decide on its own tenure, on its own curriculum, and you might have a very haphazard kind of a plan which emerges when you look at the entire country. Is that, you know, for instance, four-year course, three-year degree course, somebody might say five years. I mean, is there, is there a need for consistency or is that really not the issue? No, I, I think, see, I, I know that uh, when things are controlled and you free them up, uh, there's a fear that uh, chaos will prevail. Uh, my sense is that uh, that things do work out, and you see in other parts of our life. For example, uh, no, there is no law that says that every laptop should have two USB ports. But whatever laptop that you find in the market does have a USB port, right? Uh, I think somehow the people figure out what's really required. So I think today there is no link between what students want, what parents want, what the market demands and what the university delivered, because its financing is completely dis, uh, mismatched. Once the campus becomes dependent on serving the student, and student becomes really a, a customer, then I think the, it would not be able to do this kind of arbitrary changes uh, that you see in the current system. You really have to convince large body of students that the four-year course is better for you than a three-year course that we have been giving you so far, because they don't have to be there, unlike today. Right. So today, I think there's a lot more autocratic decision making within campus and, of course, outside within the government, largely because the students are completely irrelevant to the debate. As you pointed out earlier, tens of thousands of students' future is at stake, and nobody actually worries about them at all. It's a battle fought between the administration and the government. So uh, that's an important point, uh, Govind. I think Professor Hatekar might be able to tell us a little more because he was in a situation where actually the students were all supporting him. They attended class outside the campus when he was, you know, kind of uh, not allowed to teach in the, in the, in the university. So, Professor Hartikar, is there a strong disconnect be between what the students actually want and the administration? Because are they living on different planets? What's your experience? Well, in a sense, yes. You see, because the problem of the majority of Indian universities is uh, the you know, the, the complete stagnation that has occurred in syllabi, the methods of teaching, etc., and primarily because of the kind of political interferences uh, and a complete lack of sensitivity to uh, student needs that has crept in into various bodies of the statutory bodies of the universities. Uh, now, currently, for example, you know, the whole world is, uh, I'm a teacher of economics, but I still need to know sociology, psychology. Currently, there are no divisions like that. The world has become, the knowledge world has become far more interdisciplinary. But our, the way our universities are organized, the way our departments are organized, the way the rules are organized, uh, do not, you know, c contribute to this compartmentalization of knowledge uh, and, 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 and really limit our new knowledge creation. And, but, but within the university system, nobody has that incentive to uh, alter these systems uh, because universities are, in that sense, not really answerable to anybody because they are autonomous and as long as, you know, the powers that be satisfy their political bosses right at top, uh, nobody really questions them. So in that sense, really, I think this, if, you know, this disconnect between uh, what students are getting and what they think they should get, if this can be transferred into general unrest among students, 
which then forces the powers that be to be more sensitive. Uh, I see that as the only solution. I do not see a complete deregulation of the university system as a solution because wherever that has happened, we have not really worked, the things have not worked very well. For example, the UGC, uh, you know, specifies the minimum competencies of a teacher, the minimum salaries that should be paid to teachers. In the large number of self-financing colleges and departments that have come out in states like Maharashtra, teachers are paid a pittance, you know, teachers are paid 6,000 rupees, 12,000 rupees, those are the kinds of salaries teachers are getting. Uh, and you can imagine what kind of quality that gets in. Students are enrolled for engineering degrees, various sorts of degrees, they're given degrees, degrees are churned out, uh, but students find themselves unemployable. So there has to be some regulation, uh, but uh, I think this regulation has to be done in a way which uh, is very sensitive to the kind of uh, needs of the knowledge society today uh, uh, that we need to give to students. Uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, we obviously have colleges or u universities which are uh, self-financing and, and truly autonomous. Are we seeing a difference in the way they are being run and the results and outcomes they are achieving versus the ones that are not? Uh, I, I have not seen any study, frankly, uh, that does this comparison in a systemic manner. So I don't really have much sort of fact to depend on uh, in answering your question. Right. Uh, one thing I think we do know. Uh, about the autonomous colleges uh, that have started or have is that they're offering a far more nuanced and f better suited courses mm -hmm. right so if you look at for example what amiti offers is a private university and what for example xavier's college in bombay offers now is autonomous college right are the courses which are uh, in better demand courses that students actually uh, want to study uh, and so I think there's a better match in terms of supply and demand. Now, I they have no way of judging the quality of these courses, so I cannot say that they are right. better yeah, or worse. In fact, I mean, I'm familiar with some of them uh, in, in the Xavier's context in uh, Mumbai, and uh, yeah, I can, I can agree that, you know, some of those courses, like let's say public policy, for instance, uh, a degree course, uh, would, is something that you may not find elsewhere and is a recent innovation. That's right, yes. Uh, the public policy is a very good example of the, what Xavier's was offered. Right. Uh, NIIT, for example, which is the other private university in Delhi or near Delhi, has a very similar program uh, where they actually have now tied up with industry for part-time you know, work and placement uh, while students are studying on the campus. So I think all of those innovations which are more suitable to the demands of parents, students, and the market are happening in the autonomous uh, colleges and private colleges. So at least that part of our market process does seem to work. Quality remains an issue, and I think that's something we need to see and have a more detailed study in terms of how good or bad worse they are in the delivering quality in these new courses. Uh, a couple of comments coming in. I think we've addressed some of these questions already. The first one is, uh, is political interference degrading the quality of education? Uh, the second one also from Sesha says, don't you think all this is making our education system weaker than what it is? Uh, uh, Professor Hathikar, do you want to respond to that? interference, unwanted political interference. I can understand the state government is run by politicians, political parties, they fund the universities and therefore they rightly uh, would have some say uh, in running of a university. So if an education minister thinks genuinely that there are better ways of running a university, uh, he obviously it should be, there should be no problem in conveying that to vice chancellors or getting them to run the system like that. The problem happens when political interference happens at the point of for example, uh, giving affiliation to colleges which do not satisfy minimum criteria. For example, in Maharashtra itself, currently we're looking at 25 engineering colleges which are run by politicians, which the AICT has said should be closed down because they don't have basic facilities. But universities in Maharashtra have been giving them affiliations a year in and year out uh, to continue their degree courses in spite of them not having teachers, not having uh, infrastructure, not having buildings, so on and so forth. The education minister of Maharashtra runs a college in Mumbai in, in Mumbai in one residential building, you know, which gets affiliation every year. So it is that kind of interference, uh, which is obviously a serious problem. Uh, and uh, that kind of interference is undermining the autonomy of the universities. Universities ought to be autonomous, but we need to protect them from uh, these kinds of, I think that is the crucial problem in governance of higher education. How do you really achieve that balance? You need to get money from the state government. You can't be as entirely self-financing university because there are self-financing universities, private universities, they are small. Today in Mumbai University, I'm looking at 600,000, more than 600,000, 700,000 students over four districts of Maharashtra. 
which come from varied backgrounds. You know, I can't really uh, make all of make it a, that kind of a large system, a self-financing private kind of a system. It has to be supported by the state government. There will have to be funds coming from the state government, at least in the near future. Uh, and uh, we need to therefore understand how, you know, we need to really strengthen the way our internal bodies of the university work and the selections of vice chancellors have to be clearly apolitical. If we can achieve that, we'll be, uh, we'll, we'll just get some handle. I think Ayaz has a point, but before that, let me just take in one more comment that's come in. It yeah. says the discussion is almost a subset of one you had on unemployed, educated youth. Political interference has ensured a dismal state of affairs. Poorly educated youth who are unemployable because uh, politicians removed from reality are making decisions. I ask. So I think there are two aspects to it, Govind, and uh, I would want Professor uh, Hatekar or Part to respond to this, where the political interference is concerned. One is, of course, the monetary exploitation or yeah. financial exploitation of education. The other is infiltration into the way the education is spread across the country and which could be more, you know, insidious, so to speak. Now, the or it will not even be insidious, it's it, pretty overt. It may be very overt. Yeah. The, the problem is that if you have freedom given to all the universities, I am just trying to play a devil's advocate again here, it might end up with a free for all where the curriculum is concerned. Is that, is that a danger, is that a threat or is that acceptable? Path, do you want to go first? One way to look at that is look at other countries which do allow this kind of freedom, uh, where there is no national body that regulates what's being taught and how it's being taught. Right? So there are several countries I can name, and of course we all know them. Uh, and there is no chaos being created uh, because uh, one college teaches uh, subject differently than the other or has a different focus uh, than the other. Uh, I think uh, there's a fear of chaos is always there uh, when you remove central centralized control. And I agree that there is no scientific way to prove that nothing will go wrong. Uh, things can go wrong, right? Uh, but I think it, uh, overall, my sense is the benefits would far outweigh whatever small cost we would have to pay. So in the long run, if not immediately, we need to move in that direction. And I think we need to take small steps to get there. It would not be one giant leap probably. But I think slowly we could find ways of getting there. And part of that is what uh, was discussed earlier in terms of financing. Uh, we all agree that financing is the sort of indirect route of control by politicians uh, in terms of getting approvals and affiliations. And of course, what happened in the EU, uh, happening to the EU today. So I think I'm not saying that they become self-financing, all of them. But I'm, my point was that the government should not fund institutions, which brings the government control. They should fund the students. Right. So I would say fund students, not colleges. So it is because they fund directly the colleges and salaries of, of professors that they have this kind of overarching uh, control over the running of the college. Right. If the funding does come, of course public funding does come to the college, but through the student, then I think that kind of control would partly, large chunk of that would go away. Right. Uh, Professor Adhikar, we're uh, running out of time, so uh, you know, to come back to the question that we started with, we said that uh, is the command and control structure uh, currently that's uh, uh, being practiced, uh, even though it may not be on paper, uh, causing serious harm to our universities and thus our education system? Uh, what's, how would you like to uh, connect, respond to that? Yes, surely. You know, I will look at it at two levels. One is I don't really foresee the financial dependence of universities or colleges on the state coming to an end because we need many more universities, we need many more colleges, we have lots of young people who need to be going to colleges and universities uh, and they need to run courses even like physics or philosophy or Sanskrit for which private universities are not going to set up courses to teach. Okay, so these will have to be funded by the state, they'll have to be financial dependence. The point is that there already exists legislation which ensures that universities are independent and autonomous. Let us implement that legislation properly, let us preserve the autonomy of existing universities, existing university departments. Uh, from within universities itself, we need to be able to fight this political interference. You know, if we can fight that, uh, then I think it's not really uh, because, uh, you know, so if we can fight that, then we'll have some future. As of now, different universities are offering different courses. It's not as if the university education all over the country is identical. You know, uh, you, you mentioned autonomous colleges. Autonomous colleges are not offering new courses because they're autonomous. 
they were made autonomous they were given autonomy after it was ensured that they had the capacity to do that javier school is already a reputed college you see autonomy gives it some freedom so that kind of a slow autonomy giving autonomy to colleges universities departments within universities is happening across the country but it's happening very slowly you know by and large i think given the current setup we can fight this politicization if we strengthen the existing institutions within universities right okay uh, part uh, your uh, last response i mean our last comment on the the fundamental the question that we started with you know is this command and control structure creating a crisis of sorts in our uh, university and thus our education system also maybe if you want to quickly respond to uh, what professor said about you know the need for uh, state run state funded colleges because there are some courses there are some forms of education which can only be or best be state funded i think uh, uh, let me start there I did not say, if you heard more precisely, that we want all colleges to be supported by fees. My point was, how does the state support uh, come to the college? Right. Today, it comes directly to the college, uh, and therefore, it brings all the uh, strings uh, along with it. If the funding came through the students who go to the same colleges, the same courses uh, that are being currently offered, then the strings would be far fewer. and those will be easier to resist and fight against than what we have to fight with uh, the funding is directly to the college itself so i think um, we are not debating in terms of whether there should be any state support for colleges sure, or not sure. okay, yes, we, we are agreeing on that it's just a method of how it's being done uh, i think largely centralized command and control has never worked in any area of life and particularly in education uh, which ultimately is a very individualized personalized service if you want to think of that way where you need to figure out how to uh, provide education and learning to a student who is unique in many ways right in the same classroom and i think that requires far more individualization customization of what uh, institutions do so in that uh, area particularly command and control is completely out of place and i think that's is sort of no brainer in a way i mean everybody who should think who should thinks about this issue should understand very clearly this is a path to disaster just right. like it was in many other parts of our life that we had earlier right right thanks path uh, th thanks professor hadikar uh, ayaz last word well i think you know just going by the experience of what has happened with delhi university i think there is a need for this problem to be actually examined in its totality and you know addressed accordingly i think we've had some very good valuable inputs here govind but clearly the interest of the students and the independent functioning of the university should be paramount right interest of students and independent functioning of university should be paramount not just on paper but in reality as uh, professor hatikar just pointed out thank you very much for joining us on the india hangout we are going to be back soon thanks for watching